So welcome again to the living rooms. And uh, over the last few weeks, really from the week before Easter, we've been on a journey. It's an Easter journey that's going to continue on till the 23rd of May, the 23rd of this. We're in the month of May already. You can hardly believe it. And uh, so we're going to continue with this journey with the Lord Jesus through to the 23rd of May. And the significance of the 23rd of May is when we um, really celebrate uh, Pentecost, which is the birth of the church, when the Holy Spirit uh, was sent down from heaven by our risen Lord Jesus uh, to indwell the church and to indwell those that that love him and uh, follow him as their personal saviour. So we're journeying from Palm Sunday to Pentecost. And uh, at the moment we have um, these, uh, just like a mini series of preparing for the Holy Spirit to come. And uh, it's part three of that tonight. And uh, I've already mentioned to you that God the Holy Spirit is described in the New Testament in several ways. He's described as being like wind. And last week, we, we thought about that in Jesus' encounter with a man called Nicodemus. He's also uh, described because the Holy Spirit is not a net. He's a person. He's a person of the Godhead. Okay. And he's described as being like water. And then the third way he's described in the New Testament is like fire. And that makes us think of Pentecost Day. And all of these things are really, in a sense, uncontainable. They're unpredictable. And they're very powerful. And uh, it really sums up pretty well the activity of the Holy Spirit. Unpredictable. uh, Uncontainable. But very, very powerful if you have encountered the person of the Holy Spirit uh, in your life. And uh, so tonight we're going to focus on Jesus' teaching uh, about the, the living water of the Holy Spirit. And hence my, my illustration before I started. I've got to tell you, I'm thirsty, so I'm going to drink again. Uh, But just before we do that, uh, as a little bit of an aside, uh, the Word of God is also um, uh, described as being like water. And in Ephesians chapter 5, we read these verses. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the Word. And to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. And in John's Gospel, chapter 7, verse 17, the Lord Jesus spoke these words. If I can get the right chapter on the last, it not. Where am I? 17, verse 7. Here's what it says. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. No, sorry, that's the wrong one. It's verse 17. 16 and 17 of chapter 17. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And really the point I'm trying to make is that the word of God, the scriptures, the Bible, is described as being like uh, water that washes us. It it has this cleansing effect. It has this effect of making us more like Jesus. Uh, Making us more holy in our living. It has what the Bible calls in this Um, strange uh, biblical word. It's very important. It has a sanctifying effect. It makes us more like saints, people who are set apart for God, right? And that's why I keep banging on about reading the Word of God and trying to encourage you to read the Bible 
and to read it every day and to read it often. Because when we read the Bible, it, it washes our souls. It has this effect. It's just like God speaking into our hearts. And that's something that's very wonderful. But tonight we're thinking about water describing the Holy Spirit. So let's read together from John's Gospel, chapter 3. I hope you've got your Bible with you, either in hardback form or electronically. And uh, I'll read these verses. For the one, this is verse 34 in chapter 3. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God. Uh, and that, uh, for God gives a spirit without limit. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. These were verses that I read at the end of last week. Chapter 4. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it wasn't Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now, he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews didn't associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, Believe me, A time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit. And his worshippers must worship in the the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, am here. I I am he. Now verse 39. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. 
Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the saviour of the world. An amazing story, isn't it? Let's just pray. Father, we just thank you for these amazing things that are recorded in your word. And they're there not just as stories true as they are, but they're there for our learning. And we just ask that tonight you would teach us from the events that took place all these years ago. And that we would see the Lord Jesus for who he really is. The Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Saviour of our souls. And we ask it in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, I wonder if all of us can say honestly tonight <laughs> that we've come here because we're thirsting for more of God. I hope that we can say yes to that. No matter how much you know or you don't know and how much you've experienced or haven't experienced of God in your life. I hope that you're coming thirsty, wanting to discover more about God for yourself. And I love the words that Jesus spoke at, in the end of chapter 3, where he says, God gives the Spirit without measure. <laughs> I just love that. It tells me that the Holy Spirit will never run out. Never run out. There's always going to be enough for everyone. Enough for you. And enough for me. And that's just so good. Well, the Lord Jesus is returning from Jerusalem, where he had been when we read about him last week. And, and he had this encounter with that uh, man called Nicodemus. And his life was transformed as a result and Jesus is journeying now, and uh, I've brought this map with me, and this is the map of the, of the uh, land of Israel in Old Testament times. And right here in the center is the city of Jerusalem where Jesus had been. And he's traveling back north to the Sea of Galilee, which was really his, his home town, Capernaum, uh, in the north of the Lake of Galilee. And he's traveling northwards. And he's traveling up here and he's reached this area here, Shechem, on his journey. It's about, I don't know, 25 miles north of Jerusalem, sorry. At least 25 miles north of Jerusalem. The key thing here is that when people traveled from Jerusalem to the Sea of Galilee or north of the, the land of Israel, they normally would go from Jerusalem across the River Jordan and then up the east side of the Jordan because they didn't want to go this way. And that's what we're going to be thinking about uh, this evening. Because in verse number four, Jesus says this, and I wonder if you noticed it. He had to go through Samaria. The, the uh, King James Version, I think, says he must needs go through Samaria. This was something that he was determined that he would do. And he was doing what the vast majority of Jews would never do. They would go across and up the east side of the River Jordan. They wouldn't go through uh, Samaria because the, the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. I mean, really, with a vengeance, they really hated each other. That They wouldn't cross each other's pathways if it was all uh, at all possible. But Jesus had a reason to go there. It wasn't coincidental. It wasn't accidental. He needed to go to Samaria. Jesus always did stuff with a purpose. And, and this week, as I've been preparing this passage, God has really been speaking to me and and I know this passage well. I've known it for years. I've, I've preached on it for years. 
But God has really taken me deeper into an understanding of what has been going on here than I think I've ever appreciated uh, before. And so Jesus and his disciples arrive at this place, and it's called Sychar, um, which is, is really uh, next to Shechem. It's very close to the town of Shechem. And, 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 and Sychar is nestled between two, two mountains, uh, one of them is called Mount Gerizim, and it was a place of worship in Israel. And the other was Mount Ebal. And Sychar was very close to this town that I pointed out to you, the town of Shechem. Now Shechem was the place that 950 years before Jesus visited it. It, it was a place where the ten tribes of Israel declared independence from the tribe of Judah and the land of Israel was split in two it's very topical isn't it it really is topical and uh, right up to uh, Jesus day the land was divided and uh, the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other and Jesus had come to break down divisions he had come to take away barriers and to welcome everyone into God's kingdom. And it was a hugely symbolic journey. You see, Jews only thought they could enter the kingdom of God. But Jesus is effectively saying Samaritans can enter the kingdom of God. And God wants to say to us tonight that Scottish people can enter into the kingdom of God. English people can enter into the kingdom of God. I'm not sure if we have any other nationality. Brazilian people can enter into the kingdom of God. Jesus came to break down barriers. And saying that there is nothing can stop you should you desire to enter into God's kingdom. And that's the wonderful, amazing love of God. And that's why Jesus Christ came into the world. It's because God loves us. And he loves the whole world. And the Lord Jesus arrives at this well, which is just outside the, uh, the city. And he sends his disciples into the town to buy food. And he's there and he's all alone. And it's the hottest part of the day. And he's so thirsty. He's just walked more than 25 miles up hills, down valleys, to get to where he is. And this is where he wants to be. And he's thirsty. And he waits. And the well's called Jacob's well. Did you notice that when we were reading through? It's called Jacob's well. And it had supplied water to people and to animals for hundreds of years. And here's the other thing that I, I really got to thinking about this week. That 2,000 years before Jesus visited that well, something happened there. And we read about it in Exodus chapter 33 and chapter 34. It was this man called Jacob. Uh, who was a son of Abraham, one of the patriarchs, one of the great people in the Old Testament, who was known for his faith. And he came to this place, and he came with his family. They were on a journey, and with his flocks, and with his herds. And like Jesus, they were thirsty, they were absolutely parched. And he came to this well, and you know what he did? He negotiated to buy it from a man called Hamar. And he paid 100 shekels of silver to buy the, the, the piece of land and the well so that him and his family and his livestock could be watered. Yeah. And then when he did that and they had rested and they were satisfied, here's what Jacob did next. He built an altar there. To worship God. And here's what he calls it. He calls it El Elohe Israel. 
the mighty God of Israel. That's what he called the place, the mighty God of Israel. You see, God meant everything to Jacob. But that's not all. Uh, it also became a place of, of, of great shame and sorrow because Shechem, after whom this town is named that Jesus has come to, Shechem, the son of Hamor, he took and he raped Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. And in revenge, Jacob's sons attacked the town. They killed every single person in the town. They looted the town. And as a result, here's what it says. Jacob's family became obnoxious to the people of the land. It was a place with a history. Right down through the centuries, the Jews hated the Samaritans and the Samaritans hated the Jews. And it was here to Jacob's well that Jesus came. The mighty God of Israel came. Yes, he came because he wanted to bring hope and peace and love back to that place. You see, that's what God does. And when Jesus came to that well, he had come to meet one person in particular. It wasn't just a coincidence who he met. He wanted to meet this particular lady. And he waited. And it was hot. It was the middle of the day. And eventually this one woman comes out of the town and she comes to the well. You know, I've always taken a fairly simplified view of this passage up to now. I've always thought really it was all just about this woman who was an immoral woman and most people would say she was a prostitute. But actually God took me on a journey this week and showed me that it was much deeper than that. Much deeper than that. And uh, who knows whether this woman was maybe a lot like Dinah 2,000 years before. And who knows whether this woman had suffered a lot of abuse at the hands of men over these years. All we know is that she was consumed with, with shame. She was alone and she was ostracized to the extent that, that, that she only came out to get well water from the well when there was nobody else around because nobody else wanted to be around her. And she came to get water from the well and she met someone. She met the mighty God of Israel. El Elohi Israel. You know, Jesus wants us to meet him. He wants us to experience him, to hear his voice, to know that we're loved, no matter our background, no matter our circumstances, no matter the mess that we sometimes make of our lives. Jesus wants us to know that we are loved more than we will ever understand this side of glory. And that's why he was there at the well that day. And uh, Jesus just simply asks a question, very simple question. Will you give me a drink? Tell you what, it's a great evangelistic technique. <laughs> okay. Just ask a question, a simple question. <laughs> Will you give me something to drink? And, and she's really broadsided. She's taken aback. 
Just like Nicodemus was last week when Jesus said to, to him, uh, you must be born again to enter into the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> when, when this man, Jesus, says to the woman, will you give me something to drink? It was the last thing in the world that she expected to happen. And here's what she says, how can you, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? It was wrong in every level as far as she was concerned. He was a Jew, she was a Samaritan. She was a woman. Why would he want to speak to her? I just want you to know that Jesus will speak to anybody. He really will. And then the Lord Jesus says to her this amazing thing. If you knew who I really am, you would ask me for a drink of living water. Yeah. I can give you living water. She hadn't a clue what he was talking about. <laughs> but she, she, she only understood things on the natural level. But when she heard that, she said, yes, please. If you give me your water, I, I won't have to come back out here ever again. You know, <laughs> that would be absolutely fantastic. And then Jesus digs deeper. And he exposes her real problem. He says, go, go and tell your husband and then come back and I will give you living water. And the story tumbles out. The story of her mess of her life. That she'd had five husbands and the man that she's now living with is not her husband. Yeah. That's what Jesus told her. She didn't say to him, sorry. Jesus told her that was the case. And she was absolutely amazed. Could you imagine? She was amazed that this man knew every single detail of her life. Wouldn't you be amazed? Be amazed because I'll tell you tonight, Jesus knows every detail of our lives. He does. There is nothing that is hidden from him. And the Lord Jesus says to her, whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. The water I give will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And she's desperate to get a drink from Jesus because the wind of the Holy Spirit of conviction had come upon her. She, a messed up woman, a sinful woman, is now in the presence of the mighty God of Israel and doesn't she know it? And she's desperate to get a drink from him. And a miracle happens. And her past is dealt with. And the history is overcome. And she believes in Jesus. As he reveals to her who exactly he is. He says, I am the Messiah. I'm the one who God will send to be the saviour of the world. And she puts her trust in Jesus. She believes in him. She receives this living water. And she goes and tells her friends. And they come and they put their faith. It's a story of forgiveness. It's a story of reconciliation. It's a story of revival. Who would have believed it? That the first real revival from the ministry of, of the Lord Jesus takes place in, in Samaria. Who would ever thought that would have happened? You know, if we were to plan it, that would have been the last place in the world he would have gone. Yeah? But actually, 
It's the first place that the Holy Spirit really moves in power. Don't you wish that would happen here? That God's revival would come here. Well, I'm praying for it. I know there are many of you who are praying for it. That God would move in a powerful way. Not just in this tiny little community, but in our nation. Because our nation needs Jesus. This nation needs to know that Jesus saves. And experience his salvation. And so what is this living water that Jesus gives? Well, we're going to read from chapter 7. And verse 37 says this, On the last and greatest day of the festival, now this is Jesus back in Jerusalem, and he suddenly appears on the steps of the temple on the last day of the festival. And he stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. And now we know that the Lord Jesus had promised his disciples that after he went back to heaven, he would send the Holy Spirit to come. And they were to wait for him to come, right? And Jesus here is revealing what the living water is that he's talking about in chapter 4 to this woman. He doesn't actually say it is the Holy Spirit, but when we get to this chapter, to chapter 7, there in the temple steps at Jerusalem, he, he cries out and says, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. And when we drink, there's a spring of living water is planted within us. You know, a spring is something that doesn't just stay, you know, like this in a bottle. A spring is springs. <laughs> it bubbles up, it comes up. It, 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 it becomes more and it bubbles up and Jesus says it, it will flow out of you. Rivers of living water will flow out of you. I tell you something, if we've got the Spirit of God in us, other people are going to know about it. Because he changes our lives. And that's what's great. That's how I know I'm a Christian. Because the Spirit of God within me bears witness with the Spirit of God, that I am a child of God. And because I'm his child, I can say, Daddy. <laughs> and my Daddy loves me. And my Daddy loves you. And so I just want to close with this. Are you thirsty? No matter what you've come with tonight, and maybe some of us are coming and we're feeling a little bit like that lady, with loads of baggage, looking back in our lives and our lives just been messed up and, and we say, how could God possibly love me? I want to tell you with all my heart that God loves you beyond your wildest dreams. And that's why Jesus came. And that's why he went to the cross. And he died for my sins and your sins. The Holy One of God came and took the sins of the world upon himself and bore the pain and the punishment and the judgment in our behalf. So that when we come to him thirsty and say, I need you, Jesus. I need you more than anything. Because I need to know what it is to be forgiven. 
I need to know what it is to have the burden of the guilt that I have been carrying around with me all of my life taken away. I need to know that I'm free, really free. And so I need you, Jesus. <laughs> you know, when we come thirsty like that and we say to Jesus, I believe in you. Will you come into my life and into my heart? You know what he does? He does. <laughs> and he responds by sending his spirit. And we are born again of the spirit of God. We're brought into his family. He plants a well, a spring of living water in us. You know, if, if we've never experienced it, it can sound a bit scary. <laughs> but actually it's not, it's an adventure. A wonderful adventure. But it begins with a desire. You've got to want. You've got to be thirsty. Are you thirsty? I want just to pray with you tonight. And then David's going to sing another song. And then uh, Steve's going to come up and close in prayer. And if you're coming and you're thirsty, why don't you just say to Jesus tonight, come and take away my thirst. Give me your living water. I want more of you. Maybe for someone it would be for the first time to be saved. To become a follower of Jesus. Just say, Lord Jesus, I believe who you are, the mighty God of Israel. That you took my sin on the cross. I put my trust in you. To be my saviour. Come into my heart. So Lord, we come to you. We thank you tonight for your presence here. We thank you for this amazing, lovely story. The true story of your encounter with that woman in the well. And after she met you, her life was never going to be the same again. She was restored, she was refreshed, she was renewed, she was satisfied, she was saved. Because she received you. And Lord, as we come to you tonight, whether it's to be saved, just to say, Lord, I receive you as my saviour. Give me your living water. Maybe it's just to have hope. To say, Lord, you can give me hope. I receive your hope. Give me your living water. Maybe it's to receive healing. For some, maybe a physical healing. For some, the healing of the mind. For some, the healing of the heart. Lord, I receive your healing. Lord, I'm so thirsty and only you can satisfy me. And it's so real. Come Holy Spirit, we receive you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.